So one of the most popular types of watches has to be the chronograph. And in this video, I wanna look at some of the best luxury chronographs that you can buy here in 2022. We of course can't go over all of them, but really keying in on some of the no brainer options in the luxury segment. So as we're going through this, I know there's going to be just some questions of like, you know, what is luxury? I think that's a very subjective term, but just some things that I'm looking at here, uh, just to provide some parameters around this video. For one, we're only gonna be looking at watches that feature calibers that you can't just find everywhere. They don't necessarily need to be in-house, but they need to be movements that have some type of a proprietary element to them that makes it unique for the watch that's going to be casing it up. In addition to that, we're not going to be looking at anything crazy here in terms of high horology pieces, independent brands, really looking at key mainstream luxury brands and also no high complications like perpetual calendars on top of that I really want to stay true to uh, the original kind of basis for what a chronograph should be, just essentially a stopwatch uh, with a mechanical mechanism. We're going to also be going in ascending order, and then we're going to pick one watch per brand. Of course, there are many options for some of the brands that we're going to be looking at, so that really allows us to be more focused in our video here today. Also, if you want more things chronographs, a variety of different price ranges, I have a blog and write-up looking at around 30 of the best chronographs in the watch industry. So if you want even more than what is just included in this video here today, check it out. It'll be in the description down below. So to begin this video, just considering where should we begin? Where does the cutoff for where I think you start to get some luxury elements in a chronograph? I think you have to look around that $3,000 price range. And I think the best brand to start here is Longines. And the reason why is because they are getting movements made uh, by ETA in collaboration and are going to be exclusive for Longines. And they also come with additional upside. You have extended power reserves with these movements and also a column wheel Swiss made chronograph caliber, which when you're talking about an entry door to get into something like that, this really is where it resides. And here we have the Longines Navigation Big Eye. So this is one of my favorite lines from Longines. I actually like the petroleum blue titanium version. You have a grade five titanium case. Uh, it's going to be incredible lightweight on the wrist, which I think you get upside when you're dealing with added complication to a watch. Inside you have an Eta produced caliber made for Longines, sapphire crystal, pretty wearable case, all things considered with nice dimension set. And that petroleum blue dial is just spectacular to look at. It has this just fine finish to it that when you look very close, uh, it really starts to shine even more. This is a watch that of course is going to pull off from the heritage line and is going to kind of have some modern flair with its execution. You could of course go for the traditional Avigation Big Eye, which is gonna be more true to that 1940 style. But here I think you're getting some added benefit with the titanium grade five case, as well as just that blue that makes it a bit different compared to some of the competition that we're going to be looking at here. And for the price segment, just north of $3,000, I think this is where you start to get into to that realm of luxury uh, and what is being delivered with the final package. So to get into in-house chronograph mechanisms from a Swiss watchmaking perspective, you usually have to go above $4,000 to really even start getting into having that conversation. And for our next brand here, we have Frederic Constant in their flyback chronograph manufacturer. So a couple of reasons why I thought this was a good one to include. One is just the fact that getting a flyback chronograph in this price range, typically do not see that. That's something you will see usually on high horology brands, although perhaps not the most useful level of uh, complication, being able to have a flyback. So instead of having to reset, uh, you can then time a uh, event immediately after without having to reset the chronograph. Although perhaps not useful in today's marketplace, still is pretty cool to see in a watch in this price range around $4,000. Also, this is coming with an automatic FC 760 movement. FC, I don't think gets enough credit for what they're doing with their movement production. Uh, they have well over a dozen in-house calibers now. You may have also seen last year, they came out with a new oscillator that is a high frequency oscillator, uh, which is pretty remarkable. I can link to a video down below. Definitely would recommend checking that out because it is pretty incredible what they're doing. So all that considered, I think they do a nice job. Now this does certainly have some like Patek Philippe vibes. Maybe you see like the 5170 with uh, the overall display and how this one is oriented and its approach. Uh, but still, when you're talking about what is being delivered here, you get a flyback chronograph, $4,000. Typically you can find them for good prices pre-owned as well. I think this is certainly one to consider. Now going from one watch that doesn't necessarily get a lot of love to another one that over the last 12 months, gets as much love as pretty much any watch out there. And that's the Tudor Black Bay 
Chrono. So this is the recently unveiled at Watches and Wonders last year. Uh, these got a ton of buzz and were probably the release of the year for Tudor. And I think it makes a lot of sense why these became so popular. One probably being that so many people looking in the direction of the Daytona, then they saw these and they're like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. You're also getting a Breitling B01 caliber base on the inside. And when you're talking about that movement, typically going to find it in watches north of $8,000. Then you get a retail price here. If you're talking about on the strap, under $5,000, of course, pre-owned prices and secondary market prices have uh, allowed these to get a little bit higher in price just given the popularity. But still, all things considered, even with that being a factor at the moment of recording this video, I still think they're an interesting watch to look at. Some people are not going to really go for these as much as others just because I think uh, if you're going for just a Daytona alternative, I don't think that's the reason why you would get a watch like this. But if you want something that has value and also has kind of that dive watch DNA embedded within its creation, I think this is where this one starts to make more sense. You have an extended power reserve of 70 hours, 200 meters of water resistance, screw down pushers, a 49.8 millimeter lug to lug. So it is a broader watch. Thickness, they were able to get this down to pretty remarkable 14.2 millimeters, considering the issues with the movement and what you've seen from Breitling uh, when it comes to just the thickness of that base caliber. What they did was move the dial closer to the crystal, so there isn't as much separation there, but it does work in practice and is noticeably thinner when strapped onto the wrist. So there's no question, a Speedmaster needs to be on this list. And I think if you have to pick one, you can only pick one watch per brand, I think you have to go for the professional. Although there are plenty of other Speedmasters, as I think many of you guys know, out there on the market. But this professional, I think that is kind of the standard. That's where I think you begin. And it would be, I don't know, it's not appropriate to really feature anything else here in my opinion. So this one here we have is the Hezolite. This is the classic Speedmaster in its just iconic form in my opinion. Now the difference here, and we have a full video talking about this latest iteration of the Speedmaster Professional, new bracelet. Uh, you have different optionality with the Sapphire versus the Hezolite. And we talk about that in more detail in that video. Uh, but this also features, and probably most notable probably the manual Omega 3861 coaxial caliber on the inside. Now some purists might not like the idea of having a coaxial movement inside the Speedmaster uh, Professional, but still in terms of the overall package, I think it is a well done watch and I actually love the new bracelet. Some people are not as crazy about it as I am, but I think it helps make this watch much more wearable. I was incredibly impressed with how it did wear on even my smaller wrist. 42 millimeters with the case, 13.58 millimeters thickness, and a pretty compact lug to lug with 47 millimeters with that Hezolite version. Now, when you're trying to consider brands that have just history and connection to uh, the chronograph complication, I think you have to consider a brand like Hoyer. And from a modern perspective, you have to look at Tag Heuer. So what is a modern creation by Tag Heuer where you can look back to original Heuer and it really is kind of in the same alignment and kind of keeps alive that original ethos of the brand in some aspect, which I know some diehard Heuer enthusiasts from the vintage perspective do have mixed feelings about the current position of the brand, but one that I think still does a very nice job of looking back and showing some reverence to original designs is going to be the Tag Heuer Monaco Caliber II. So this watch here, if you are not familiar, is going to have a pretty unorthodox feel on the wrist. It has very retro 1960s, 70s vibe, vibes completely. There's really nothing else that wears like it. This is a watch that I certainly would recommend wearing on your wrist or at least trying once before you write it off. Uh, I was somebody that I just saw this thing, never really did much for me, but this is a watch that has grown on me a little bit more uh, in terms of just how it's presented and there's actually nothing else really like it. Some people might say, hey, there's a reason for that. I just don't think it's a good watch, but other people will say this is a piece of Hoyer's history and I think it's still a great representation of the era in which it represents. You have the Steve McQueen connection. It's mid 20th century chronograph design and I think, again, it still is an icon to this day and I don't use that term lightly. It is going to wear larger than the dimensions set is going to suggest it is a bit thick. I think that is the one downside of dealing with this watch. It is going to have some presence, 100 meters of water resistance, Hoyer Caliber 2 on the inside, of course, a sapphire crystal with that retro display. There's a few different dial displays that you can go for. I just like the classic blue and red. So last year was a big year for Zenith in 2021. They released a couple notable chronographs, and I think the one that got the most hype and attention and people are kind of falling over themselves to get is the Chronomaster Sport. I think the reason why people, of course, like that watch is the connection to the Daytona, and I have a whole video on that one and just kind of stating my opinion on that. Uh, but if it has to come down to my favorite model release from Zenith last year, 
it has to be the Chronomaster original. This watch remains true to what Zenith embodies from a manufacturing perspective, while also being a breath of fresh air for one of the more wearable chronographs you're gonna find in this contemporary market. And I actually have one on my wrist right now just to show how much I really enjoy this one. Now this one comes in with a 38 millimeter case. You have that A386 design case, stainless steel, standardized production as well. So that's a huge new and improved benefit to this watch and this design. A lot of just recreations and limited editions in the past in stainless steel uh, with this case style, but this now is in full production. You have a few different options in terms of dial I like the tri-color uh, classic El Primero display. It does have 100 meters of water resistance. On top of that, you're getting the El Primero 3600. The notable thing with that movement here is going to be the tenth of a second display at the center. So you have a tenth of a second being displayed on that outside track. And then you have the central chronograph second hand in red that's going to spin around uh, freely and be able to uh, tell the time on that ten, uh, tenth of a second scale. Again, not the most useful thing in day-to-day -day practicality, but still pretty cool to see in action and being in a watch around eight to $9,000. Also, one thing I will mention about this, if you have smaller wrists, you also like a chronograph, as you're seeing here, most of them being thicker on the wrist. This just goes to show the power of the El Primero uh, as a base and what this movement was able to accomplish and still accomplishes uh, in the marketplace for luxury chronographs. You're talking about a thickness of a case well under 13 millimeters, which when you compare it to the competition, as you see here, is remarkably thin in comparison. Now, so far, you probably noticed that there's a lot of icons on this list, and I think it goes to show the power of having a luxury chronograph icon in your catalog. And Breitling certainly has one, and that one has to be the Navitimer. So the Navitimer was originally unveiled in 1969, and it has become Breitling and almost pilot watches in general's kind of maybe mascot in a way. It's become their most prominent model and is a watch that I commonly think of when I'm thinking about aviation and pilots watches. In fact, it actually is the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association's uh, officially adopted watch. So that's probably saying something on just the iconic status when it comes to pilot watches that this watch obtains. The Navitimer does have a reputation of maybe being blingy in the last 10 or so years and having Breitling kind of change direction uh, in that period, but now with George Kern at the helm, I think that they've restored a lot of what I would say is the classic Navitimer DNA. These are typically larger watches. They do come with the new B01 movement as referenced earlier with the Tudor uh, connection here. These of course are gonna be more expensive, but when you're talking about an icon, the Navitimer has to be that when you're talking about setting a standard for what a pilot watch almost it seems to look like. So speaking of pilot watches, a brand that certainly has a lot of reputation in that arena has to be IWC. But of all their chronographs, even their pilot chronographs that are out there, I still think my personal favorite from them, from a chronograph perspective, has to be the Portugueser chronograph. Now, the model that we're looking at here is a reference with this just striking green dial. Uh, it just, I think it looks fantastic. Uh, the vertical register display of the chronograph, it just has very nice symmetry. Uh, the leaf style hands and this green striking dial, I think come together to really produce a beautiful end result. Now this comes in with a 41 millimeter case thickness at around 13 millimeters, which I think is great for a watch in this uh, segment of chronographs. It does have more of an elegant form factor and design on the dial, which I think is a nice a breath of fresh air from the sporty undertones that most chronographs will have in this price range, which I think makes it unique. This watch operates on the automatic IWC 69355. And although I don't know if this is technically a well-adopted term as a dress chronograph, but if there is a watch in this segment that probably qualifies for that type of classification, it's probably this one. Now, despite this brand producing a lot of high horology pieces, when you're talking about around $10,000 and what they're offering, I think this is one that I certainly wanted to include in this video because I think it's becoming more compelling as time goes on, and that is with the JLC Polaris Chronograph. Now, I'm a big fan of the Polaris collection. I think it's pretty much untapped in a way. I think it's untapped uh, in terms of its potential, both from the traditional three-hand side, uh, the diver side, and just also looking at the chronograph side. I just 
think that this model from the sportier side of JLC has a lot more runway in front of it if they do kind of take hold of it. And this is one of those models as well that I think could be appropriate for many people out there. It has refinement very similar to that of the IWC uh, Portuguese or Chronograph, but it does it in JLC's manner. And the blue dial variant here that you have on this watch, uh, I just think it really does just pop out at you. And I think this is one to consider. Also getting an exhibition case back on these, which surprisingly compared to some of these other watches is going to be rare. So I think if you're going to be getting a Chronograph mechanism, they could be pretty attractive looking movements. Uh, so it's nice to be able to see uh, where your hard earned money is going. But considering the market dynamics of some of these luxury chronographs and you know, also being able to get into a brand with a reputation like JLC at this price range, this is an overlooked model from both an industry-wide perspective, but also from just looking at JLC in general as a brand. And to round out our list here, I think this is probably the most appropriate one to round out the list with, and that is with the Rolex Daytona the 116-500LN. So of course you have to mention the Daytona. Now retail prices here, you're looking at just north of $14,000 now. These have been rising over the last few years, but the most notable thing of course with these is going to be the secondary market prices of these and just not being able to get one at retail at the moment. Now, of course, there's a lot of politics and I don't wanna get into it in this video. I have a whole video kind of talking about the market dynamics of Rolex and brands like Patek Philippe and those that are very difficult to find some of their key models at retail. This is certainly the one for Rolex that has become the most difficult, but if you can get it close to retail, there's no question that this is a fabulous watch in that general price range, although perhaps not available in that price range. As Rolex has gone more modern and kind of moved away from the classic mid 20th century designs, some of their models just feel like they lost a pulse of what worked in the past. I mostly look at the Submariner as an example of that. It's just very distant to what it was years ago. As I like vintage subs more in terms of their looks, their wearability compared to that of the modern perspective. But when it comes to the Daytona, I like the ceramic Daytonas. I think they are their own unique thing. They don't feel like they're the most blingy thing as well compared to the, to the sub in some ways. Yes, in some elements, some people will probably disagree with me on that, but it just feels like a modern sports chronograph in so many ways. And I get why these are so hyped. I do like the look of the Daytona. I would certainly not spend what the going rate of these watches are going at for right now. I certainly would not pay the premiums in the marketplace for that. I think there are plenty of other watches. I think I have a whole video where I look at Rolex Daytona alternatives and all the alternatives were about the same price as the secondary market for the Daytona. But still, even with this considered, if you can get this watch around retail, you can't dismiss it, no question about it. But all right guys, that is my list looking at some of the best luxury chronographs that you can find in 2022. I had to make the cutoff somewhere. Of course, you can include a lot more. I didn't wanna start getting into brands like Patek Philippe, Langa, uh, Vacheron, because that would just start getting this into a totally different realm of possibilities. And I didn't know where I could then make the cutoff. I thought, felt like this was a little bit more appropriate. But which one of these watches is your favorite? Which one would you recommend for somebody that is looking to buy that luxury chronograph uh, and add it to their collection? Also, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that. Also check out teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all of our new products. We also have an emerging pre-owned page. We have new models coming in every single week. And if you're looking to move on from your watch and sell it, fill out the form on the sell page on teddybaldasar.com. And if it's a good fit for our program, one of my colleagues will be in touch with you. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.